All right, I will go ahead and kick us off. Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending the second session of the monitoring and evaluation series. My name is Carrie Schaefer, and I am the project coordinator for EcoAdapt's National Adaptation Forum. I'm going to say just a few words here at the beginning, and then I will pass it off to our session moderator, Matt, for the rest of the time. To begin with, I wanted to orient all of you to go to webinar, which is what we're using for this session, and just point out kind of a few of the main features here. In the bottom right corner, you will see these four arrows that are facing inward. This is how you can make the app go into full screen mode if you want to. If you're interested in asking questions throughout the session, there are kind of two main ways that you can ask questions. The first is by raising your hand. So if you raise your hand, what I can do is take you off of mute and then you can speak directly to our presenters. And then the other way is through the questions tab. And so in the questions tab, you can type your question directly into the box here and send it off. And then we'll have some time at the end of our session today to get to questions. The other resource that we're gonna be using during this session is um, a Padlet. And so this is really just a place where we can compile various resources relating to monitoring and evaluation. If there's something that you're interested in posting here, what you can do is add a new comment with this plus sign button in the bottom right hand corner. And so your box will pop up, you can write something in, add any attachments, whether that's an article, a link, maybe a photo, and then publish it. And what you'll see once I share this Padlet link is that we've already populated the Padlet with a lot of resources from our very first session and we will continue to add resources throughout the series. So hopefully this serves as kind of a library on monitoring and evaluation that you all can come back to after the series has wrapped. And so let me, I will send that into the chat once I wrap up here. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to touch on is that this is just one session in an entire series. Our first session was two weeks ago on March 16th, and that recording is available on our website, which is nationaladaptationforum.org. You all are taking part in the second session today. And then our third session will be two weeks from now on April 13th. That is really gonna be focused on natural resources and the conservation sector. And then our final session will be um, a training that's really focused on um, developing indicators and metrics. And so I wanna note that a separate Zoom link will be required for that registration. It is not yet posted, but you can check back to our website in order to register for that session. And then the final thing that I'm gonna to touch on today um, is polling. So when you all registered, we asked you a few specific questions. And unfortunately, due to an error with our GoToWebinar uh, registration process, we did not get those answers to your registration questions. So what I'm doing right now is dropping a survey link into the chat that all of you can see. And we would really appreciate if you just took a moment to fill out the survey. This is just three really brief questions about um, who our attendees are. And this information is really important for us to understand who is attending events. Are we reaching a diverse audience? Um, and if we're not, you know, it will help us to kind of understand how we can do a better job in order to reach that audience. So I'm just gonna pause here for a moment to allow you all to fill out that survey. Um, I do want to note that the responses to the survey will remain anonymous and your participation um, is completely optional. But I will pause there for a second and allow you all to take some time to do that. And again, if you just joined, I will drop this survey link into the chat. Just three really quick questions. Uh, 
Okay. So with that, I am going to pass it over to our session moderator, Matt, to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Matt. All right, thanks, Carrie. Um, and again, welcome everyone to this second session of a four-part virtual series devoted to monitoring and evaluating climate adaptation progress. And of course, a special welcome to our presenters. Um, thank you all for being with us today. My name is Matthew Malika. I'm currently a postdoc fellow with the Community Resilience Program at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. Um, and I'm also a faculty fellow in the Hazard Reduction and Recovery Center at Texas A&M University. I was really pleased to be part of the committee for this virtual NAF series, um, and I'm really excited to be here today to help moderate what promises to be uh, a second fantastic and informative session. Um, we have three really excellent presentations um, today that will provide, um, as it says, a well-rounded perspective on monitoring and evaluation um, at three different spatial scales, global, national, um, sort of federal, and then uh, local. And I also suspect that these presentations are gonna be very thought-provoking and should lead to a great discussion. So we've reserved about 30 minutes at the end of today's session for that purpose. So please, um, as Carrie mentioned, feel free to post your questions throughout the presentations and then we'll use them to guide the Q&A um, at the end of the session. So the presentations this afternoon are gonna proceed um, according to scale from largest to smallest. Um, we'll begin in just a minute with the global perspective um, offered by Dr. Colleen McGinn, Senior Resilience Specialist with ISET International. Um, her presentation is entitled Raising the Bar, Designing, Monitoring, and Evaluating Climate Resilience. And um, it's my understanding that there was a scheduling conflict, so Dr. McGinn's presentation was pre-recorded. Um, and her colleague, Kenmani Venkateshwaran, is here to help with the discussion and Q&A at the end. So, hi, Kenmani, and welcome. Um, then at the national scale, um, a federal perspective is going to be offered by um, Catherine Godfrey and Joe Thompson, both of whom are assistant directors with the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Hi, Joe. Thanks. Um, their presentation is entitled Adaptation and Accountability, the Role of GAO's Disaster Resilience Framework in System-Wide Action. And then finally, offering a local perspective um, is Dr. Malgozia Marajevich, an associate research scientist at Columbia University, who will be presenting on her work with local communities in a presentation entitled enabling homeowners to adapt to coastal flooding, the case of Rockaway in New York City. So I think with that, let's um, start with Dr. McGinn's uh, pre-recorded presentation, if you wouldn't mind, Carrie. Yeah, I don't know if it's just me, but there doesn't seem to be any sound. Let's back up and try this again. Oh, gotcha. Okay, let me see if I can get that fixed. Yeah, it looks like it's not just me. Okay. My name is Dr. You. Colleen McGinnon. I'm a senior resilience specialist with the Institute for Social and Environmental Transitions. We are a small action research NGO, uh, all remote staff. Uh, there's a concentration in Boulder, Colorado. But I am pre-recording this session because I live in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and it's about 3 a.m. for me. Um, nevertheless, delighted to be here um, through the miracle of technology and my colleague, Gun will also be attending the entire conference and is here to take questions. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you here and um, present a brief presentation on raising the bar, um, um, designing, monitoring, and evaluating climate resilience. Um, what we as evaluators can do to advance climate change policy and praxis, and what are the, some of the methodological challenges that we're dealing with. Um, first of all, a lot of people tend to 
tend to think of M and E in, in sort of a one big lump. It's, a, it's M and E together. Monitoring and evaluation actually do two different things, and they're very complementary, which is why they get lumped together. Um, but I always approach all M and E work, and especially evaluations, with with two overarching questions. One is job early monitoring. Um, are we doing things right? Are the trains running on time? Are we meeting our targets, staying on budget, getting through the work plan? All of that day-to-day -day project management stuff that's really important because we need to be accountable to senior management, to our donors, um, and everything else, everyone else. Um, this information, though, however useful it is for day-to-day -day project management, is not always very interesting from a learning perspective. And that's where sort of evaluation comes in with the larger question, which is, are we doing the right things? These are matters of, um, of strategy, of effectiveness. Are the interventions actually making a difference on the ground and ultimately having impact and generating significant change? Um, so that's m and &E. I like to think of it in terms of DML, though, which is design, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And the design and the learning are sort of the bookends to this process, because monitoring and evaluation ultimately rests on your program design. And then learning is learning from experience, generating evidence, um, and using it to inform decision making, whether it's internal in, in terms of management or donors to a program, but also broadly to an external um, to an external audience. I think DML is especially essential from a climate resilience perspective. Um, and some of the issues are that um, the, qu the question of what sets climate resilience apart from business as usual, particularly in a sector that's Easiest, easily and obviously related to climate and weather conditions, such as agriculture. Um, early on, in, when climate change adaptation was, was emerging as a, as a body of practice, um, there was a huge fixation on, so what are the indicators and how do we count this? Um, and that, those efforts, while important, and there's still very, very important ongoing efforts, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to downplay the significance of that. Ultimately, climate resilience and climate change adaptation don't have a metric. There's nothing to count. It's, it's how many units of adaptation do I have? Uh, how much more climate resilience am I? Because I went to some workshop. Um, we don't have anything specific to count. And although climate change is a global problem, climate resilience is fundamentally local. It depends on context and situation and the intersection of climate hazards with population vulnerability. And all of this comes together in a climate rationale in the program design phase. This is where, um, you know, the, the program is explained in terms of how it affects or addresses uh, or reflects um, these, these thorny questions about specific climate, has, climate hazards, their intersection with, with population vulnerability, and how this intervention is going to change something, something important. The climate rationale is what sets climate resilience programming apart from business as usual. And it's critical and it's key. We don't, by contrast, um, have a very good track record with sort of doing stuff, say, this is our agriculture program, and uh, five years later going, so what did we achieve from a climate perspective? Um, there's, no, there's nothing to count. And if you don't have a climate strategy, your, your m and &E framework is not going to actually get at this um, from a climate perspective. Um, it's also really critical to harness monitoring and evaluation to build a global evidence base on effective climate action. Um, this is a new problem. This is a brand new problem. Um, and that means we don't have an established body of best practice. Everybody is experimenting. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that the most 
funded body of research, applied research, on what constitutes effective climate action is monitoring and evaluation. But if it, we're going to make that powerful research, uh, we've got to make our reports and our evaluations um, tackle big questions, not just, you know, did we meet our targets? Did we, um, how many, how many beneficiaries did we have? You know, how'd you manage COVID? Uh, were there delays? Uh, we need to be tacking, tackling big questions of what does this achieve from a climate perspective in a way that meets the urgency of the global climate threat? Because we've got one generation to figure this out. And frankly, we're not. A lot of the reason why we're not is that there's quite a bit of business as usual, sustainable development programming, um, however excellent it is in many ways, um, but it, it's often being framed as climate adaptation and climate resilience when it's really not, it's not convincingly or not strongly so. And if we're going to meet the urgency of the glo global climate Threat. We've got to figure out what is effective from a climate perspective. And ME is one of our most powerful potential tools to build that evidence base and inform that decision making. Um, I wanted to touch very briefly on um, a couple of sort of practical things to bear in mind about results frameworks and indicators. First of all, as I, I mentioned a moment ago, there is no metric count. Uh, there's no bottom line for climate resilience. It's an idea. It's an idea with lots of different ideas and it, what constitutes climate resilience shifts from one place to the others. So uh, trying to find this magic single um, in indicators or standardized set of indicators is quite frankly chasing a chimera. Um, you know, the, the indicators are important, they're critical, but they're data points. Um, and because, because climate resilience is a poor methodological fit for certain things, um, we have to we have to think beyond individual indicators and measurement and think in terms of strong, sound theory of change that inform the program design. And that program design is then distilled into a tailored results um, framework. Um, also a big yes to tackling the complex cross-cutting questions surrounding gender and social inclusion, rights-based approaches, and or climate justice. Um, and above all, I think it's time that the, um, uh, to embrace the, uh, the, uh, the long overdue backlash um, around obsessive measurement disorder. This is a technical term. It's been defined as the intellectual fallacy that counting things improves decisions. Um, let's count what needs to be counted and analyze that quantitative data judiciously. But um, in the words of Albert Einstein, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Um, um, endlessly quantifying things because then it's smart. Um, can be actually problematic in many res respects because when you're dealing with large, complex questions of systems change, scale, and uh, soft aims, what I mean by soft is not so tangible ones. For example, climate justice, um, you have to you have to step back a little bit from the indicators and present it in terms of research questions. Um, I'm running out of time here already. Let me move along quickly. I think that there's two pillars of uh, climate change programming. One is the mainstreaming of climate into sustainable development. This is critical. This is key. This is infusing sustainable development with, um, with some climate perspectives and climate considerations. Very important. Um, and this is being led very strongly, especially by um, some of the bilateral donors who are systematically um, mainstreaming climate into all of their development programming. Um, what I see, though, is a lot of programs or a lot of organizations, rather, that have done a great job with mainstreaming. And then they're looking towards sort of climate-specific funding, climate-specific money. 
um, you know, green climate fund, and now we're going to get twenty million dollars. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind the climate dedicated finance has to be sets a much higher bar than mainstreaming climate into sustainable development. They're reaching towards transformational change from a climate perspective, climate-centered policy and practices, very, very strong climate rationales, and fundamentally forging new development pathways. Also very important and critical. I think we need both the mainstreaming and the transformation agendas. Um, but what I'm saying is we need them both because they do different things and they complement each other. Um, but they both also present very different and many challenges, um, but also opportunities on how to define um, define what constitutes effective action from a climate perspective and move forward with that. Um, in terms of methods and approaches for both mainstreaming and transformational change, some of the trends that um, are happening including a, a reach beyond accountability focused evaluations and embracing much more learning driven ones those that are led by research questions rather than targets and indicators um, embracing theory not because i have a fancy phd that sounds good but theory is simply a framework that predicts change um, and because we have a new problem with um an evidence base that's only emerging theory is the best thing that we've got to work with it's our most powerful tool uh and we're all experiments um so embracing theory-based evaluations that tackle the complex complex questions is critical um and i want to just touch upon two trends in m e that i think are are balancing out some of um some of the approaches that, that, that quite a few organizations and individuals have become frustrated with, which is that, you know, the individual smart indicators, they're too, they're too narrow and they sometimes don't say very much. Um, as Kusak and Risk put it in uh, their fantastic manual steps to results-based management, the so what factor, you know, so you've trained all the people and you've instituted the reforms, you've done this and this and this, so what? Where's the impact? The so what question is, where is the impact? And the two trends towards that um, seem opposite, but they're actually complementary. They both tackle complexity. One is big data, big complex statistical uh, data analysis, not just baseline and endline, but like what's going on from a change perspective. And then the other side of that coin is nuanced qualitative um, research qualitative evaluation um quickly an example in action uh, that i wanted to highlight from iset international i'm a team leader on this global portfolio evaluation of the climate justice resilience fund this is a foundation so um, um it's allowed to be a little bit uh, edgier than some of the government money it issues a diverse collection of grants spanning community-based projects global entire evaluation was driven by research questions, not by indicators, and based on narrative research methods, which simply begin by inviting participants to tell the story of their experience and what has been achieved, what's been achieved and what's been changed. And this was systematically analyzed to demonstrate best practices and lessons learned of diversity a lot of really, really interesting things. Um, and um, it, it was a delight to work with this foundation, um, both, on the, both on the evaluation, but also particularly in terms of pushing, pushing the edge of what we know about how to address and how to embrace and how to fund community-based climate resilience. Um, again, M and E is here as a tool to raise that bar. Where our research helps set the standards on what constitutes effective climate action, and if we go beyond our sort of day-to-day -day quarterly report or annual report for more routine work, which is essential and important, but um, if we take extra steps.
stop our activity. Um, I think we can really advance global climate policy and practices. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over to Kanmani for questions. All right, and I think, Carrie, am I correct that we're going to do questions at the end today? Yes, yeah, we're going to save all of them till the end. All right, saving all questions to the end, so keep them coming. Um, well, that was very interesting. Um, thank you to Colleen and Kanmani for providing that presentation. Um, now, as we transition to our national or federal level um, scale, I was asked to begin with a quick poll. Um, and Carrie, can you help me out with that? Um, the question is, who in the audience has heard of GAO before today? Yes, I just launched our poll now. All right, well, we'll give you all a minute or two to answer that. And um, and then Carrie, you'll give us updates um, as the answers roll in, is that correct? Yes, I will. Right now, only 1% has voted, but that 1% is at 100% yes. So that's Okay, it. so far so good. Surprise. Um, so are rolling in though, so I will keep you all updated. We're at about 50% of our votes. We have about 60% at yes, 20% at no, and the rest are unsure. Okay. So a majority at yes, which I think Joe will be happy to hear. <laughs> yes, surprised. Joe surprised, all right. Um, yeah. Well, do we want to give another minute or I think we, uh, Joe, do you have your answer? What do you think? I think we're good. Okay. All right. I appreciate well, appreciate you asking the question though. Yeah. No, and, th and thanks everybody for your participation too in that. Um, so I guess with that, um, maybe Catherine and Joel, tell us all about the GAO's work in the climate adaptation realm and especially the disaster resilience framework, right? That's right. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm, 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 very pleased to be uh, going after that uh, first video presentation. Uh, I thought some of the uh, observations made by Dr. McKinn were, were spot on. And, uh, you know, my agency is probably one of the primary practitioners of obsessive measurement disorder, as she put it. And uh, I'm here to let you know that we understand that and we're trying to do better. That is the point of the disaster resilience framework. We recognize that if you're trying to audit uh, climate resilience, you need to take a different approach to auditing and to trying to make federal operations work better. Catherine, are you able to share the slides? No? Hmm. Okay. Let me get that over to you, Catherine. Does that work now? In any case, yeah, we got the slides up now. We're good. So, um, Many of you have heard of GAO, but to keep it really brief, you know, we, uh, we're a congressional agency. We, uh, you know, do most of our work at the, at the request of Congress to try to figure out ways to make federal programs more efficient and effective and to save taxpayers money. You know, we're known as the congressional watchdog. We are the supreme audit institution of the United States. And basically, wherever the federal government spends money, we try to make sure that it's spent well. So. And moving on to the next slide, what does that really mean for climate change? Well, you know, we talk a lot about definitions here in this space, you know, climate change adaptation or, you know, what are we talking about? Climate resilience. But, you know, when it comes down to it, resilience itself has no meaning at all. It's, it really is the new sustainability. So what we need to do as practitioners is to be very clear about what we're making resilient to what. And in our case at GAO, we're trying to make federal programs more resilient to changes in the climate so as to save taxpayers dollars. That is the federal role and we focus on the federal role at GAO and basically try to understand how federal programs work, how you can build climate resilience into those programs and how you can save taxpayers money. And we do it from two different angles that we combine to mean climate resilience. There's the sort of hazard mitigation approach. I don't know if you noticed on the first slide, but Catherine is an assistant director in our Homeland Security and Justice team. They're the people that may mainly look at FEMA and all the FEMA programs. I'm in our natural resources environment team and we do the climate change adaptation stuff. 
but functionally in the federal government, those programs fund climate resilience activities. So we, we include both of those types of programs in the definition, along with many other federal efforts. Um, you know, so what we're trying to do as GAO is how do we understand making investments ahead of time before a disaster hits so as to buy down the risk to federal agencies through disaster assistance. We don't want to we don't want to pay a lot in disaster assistance. Catherine just sent me a, a tweet or a chat. Um, anyhow, um, the goal here is to spend money up front to buy down our risk at the back end. So how do we make our programs and institutions more resilient to changes in the climate? And do we have the right institutions in the first place? And this is really the crux of why GAO put climate change on its high risk list, specifically limiting the federal government's fiscal exposure by better managing climate change risks. It's something that we report on to Congress every two years at the beginning of every Congress as an issue that we need to address as a nation. Next slide, please. So there's two main approaches that GAO would employ uh, classically as we look at uh, federal environmental programs and climate change programs to the extent they exist. There's the classic oversight model, which I think was taken down pretty well by the prior speaker, which, uh, you know, basically we measure things to death and we try to evaluate programs uh, and whether they achieve their goals. And we come up with a classic way of measuring things and, and find a deficiency in that and make recommendations for how programs can improve. That doesn't work too well when there's not actually very many federal programs to deal with climate change at all, let alone climate resilience. So we have to take more of a strategic insight and foresight approach, more of a forward-looking stance as GAO. How can we proactively manage, um, uh, you know, how can we basically provide a pathway for federal agencies to improve their operations? That's what it's all about here. So it's a qualitative way to improve your operations. And we produced guidance and in terms of the disaster resilience framework to do just that. Next slide, please. So this will look familiar based on the last presentation. You know, there's two ways that you can do that. You can mainstream climate risk into all the things that the federal government does right now to make sure that climate risk is accounted for in, you know, flood risk management infrastructure when we build that stuff in agriculture programs in roads. This is really important right now with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and all the resilience components of that transportation reauthorization within there. There's a whole bunch of climate change adaptation plans that came out due to executive orders that spell out what agencies are trying to do in order to build climate risk in their day-to-day -day operations. You know, uh, so we can mainstream climate risk in everything we do. And then there's the question of whether we have the right institutions in the first place. And, and there's probably some government-wide gaps. In fact, GAO has pointed out several of those. We need a national climate information system to share authoritative information so everybody's on the same page so they don't Everybody doesn't have to moonlight as a climate scientist in their free time, try to figure out what they need to adapt to. Um, there's also a federal role in identifying high priority projects uh, that can only be funded at the national scale because of their scale. Um, the disaster resilience framework can be used to evaluate federal mainstreaming efforts and gaps in current approaches that may require new institutions. So what is the disaster resilience framework? Now I turn it over to Catherine. Hi. Um... Hopefully people will let me know if you can't hear me. I was having a little bit of trouble with the mute. Um, yeah, and so I just want to reiterate at this point that, um, you know, we are here to talk to the monitoring and evaluation community and the um, climate adaptation community. I agree with a lot of what was said in the last presentation and want to contextualize a little bit that, you know, at the Government Accountability Office, we do generally do what's called a performance audit, where we look at uh, programs within the federal government and identify um, issues and recommendations for improvement. I understand that some in the um, evaluation community would disagree with whether or not that's exactly evaluation. It's a little bit of a different animal. Joe, talk to you a little bit about um, our um, approach, both in terms of the mainstreaming and the strategic, and I think importantly that this is an approach to performance evaluation that we have not um, generally taken in the accountability and audit communities in the past, where we are attempting, as we, you know, we heard the need for in the first presentation to, through that lens, look at a whole systems, um, big picture, cross-cutting effort throughout the federal government. So when we created this framework, 
our aim was both to focus on um, the future and not wait until terrible things happen before we make recommendations to fix them. And also to bring together in the way that Joe talked about a lot of different kinds of opportunities for action across the entire federal government. And so when we started this project uh, to create this framework, we asked ourselves the question, what would it look like if the federal government were firing on all cylinders in order to be able to influence the whole system? So the federal government doesn't control all of these pieces, but um, has influence through direct action and influence through incentives and influence through um, other kinds of policy tools um, that could have effects throughout the whole system. Um, and so when we use this uh, tool as criteria uh, for performance audits, um, we're looking to identify gaps in existing federal efforts and analyze any kind of federal effort for um, the opportunity to build in things that are going to increase disaster resilience. And when um, we talk about disaster resilience, we're thinking um, both about climate adaptation actions and about what in the emergency management community is called hazard mitigation. Uh, we see a lot of overlap between the two of them. Both are kinds of actions um, that can be taken at multiple levels uh, that, uh, that in the end increase overall resilience. Um, we also envision this um, framework to be useful to federal officials and to officials um, throughout the system, particularly in government, in terms of just thinking through what are the things I need to think about when I think about how my action, my policy, my programs are going to uh, lead to better disaster resilience. So when we use this tool, it's a little bit different than some of our other audit approaches and methodologies. We um, we are not looking to say, "Gotcha, you did the you did you did the wrong thing. You better never do it again." Um, instead, we're looking we're looking forward. And also, it's not a um, it, it is not intended to focus on. I'm gonna. I'm going to go through the three principles, um, high-level principles that we organized all of the information in. Are these the only? Is this the only way we could have organized these in a framework? No, um, but we think that we have covered um, broadly and at a high level so that we can use this in a in a flexible way. All of the. Uh, key ideas and things that the federal government needs to do to take the, the, the kind of action that we're talking about here. Um, and so the first principle among the three is information. And the information principle, the framework has um, a, a many more questions than the questions you see on the screen in front of you, but these are examples of some of the kinds of questions that, that um, comprise the framework. These are the questions that when we're evaluating opportunities to build disaster resilience, climate adaptation, and hazard mitigation actions into programs, um, uh, what are the questions that we ask? And so in the information arena, what we're trying to get at is, a, is kind of twofold. First of all, do, does everybody, all the decision makers in the system that might uh, take action that leads to greater disaster resilience, have reliable and understandable information. Um, and so we think about how the federal government might translate information um, so that it's digestible um, for multiple audiences so that it is um, helps uh, even elected officials and city planners and uh, everybody else out there understand and believe I have this kind of climate information. Um, this is how much how much I can rely on it. This is what it tells me about what my risks are. And then also the ability to understand information about what my options are to address that risk. Um, and so as you can see, that's kind of a, a shared goal with the um, monitoring and evaluation community. And, and what we're talking about here is um, how does the federal government do do the best that it can in its 
part in every corner to create the conditions where that can happen. So the other, an, the, uh, another of the three I's, the three principles that we have in here is integration. Um, integration covers a couple of things. It covers how federal programs fit together in order to um, deliver a, a, a cogent strategy for building disaster resilience, um, both at the highest strategic level across the federal government and um, across uh, different programs that deliver the same sort of aims in the, in the same sectors. Uh, um, disaster assistance programs come up a lot because they are very fragmented and um, cut across the federal government. And so when we come in and rebuild in the post-disaster environment, how do we make sense of what we're doing to reduce future disaster, disaster risk when um, programs with all kinds of different purposes and rules are coming uh, together? Um, another piece of this integration is understanding the interconnections among infrastructure, different types of infrastructure, um, and um, the ecosystem ecosystems and infrastructure and how they uh, result in disaster resilience so that when we are, you know, when the federal government is investing in or influencing action, um, it is doing its part to make sure that we aren't taking actions that um, contradict each other, um, that are redundant of each other, so that we can, again, look at this as a whole system. Um, in order to build disaster resilience across the system. I mean, I think one example here, a lot about here is when federal money might come in and um, elevate the homes in a flood prone community, but not the roads, right? So you can't get in and out, uh, it, uh, even though you the houses aren't damaged, the community can be cut off for a long time or vice versa, you know, if we address the roads, but not the uh, the buildings that can be problematic. Um, okay. The final uh, piece of this is incentives. Um, and so incentives is fairly straightforward, although a little bit more difficult in application for us um, uh, because we don't generally tell Congress to create incentives out of whole cloth. Um, but it certainly is a situation where we want to make sure that federal programs are thinking through um, when we offer grants, when we offer other kinds of um, financial and non-financial non support, is it leading to the outcomes that we're looking for here? And a, a, another piece of incentive, the flip side of incentives is disincentives. Um, we have experienced a lot in our past work uh, situations where the complexity of federal programs and again the like the intersection among all of the programs that come from the federal treasury um, and you know the state and local governments have the expectation of experiencing them as uh, you know, federal programs that are seamless and fit together and make sense and that is not the case um, and it tends to dissuade people from from using them um to maximize their opportunities to create resilience um so i just before i turn it back over to joe want to share one example of a um recommendation that we have made using the um integration and information pieces of the framework um to to an agency fema to help uh create a, a both to you know a, a it was a monitoring, and well, it was an evaluation exercise when we identified this need, and it also is to create a better space for monitoring and evaluation. So this, we want this federal agency to play its part um, in creating a, a whole systems environment. And so we, the conclusion that we reached here is that with high need and finite funding for hazard mitigation, collecting and sharing information on project cost effectiveness is crucial. Um, for state and local and federal agencies. And so we um, recommended to FEMA that it um, develop a plan for future loss avoidance studies to make sure that it cuts across multiple hazard types and as many hazard types as they can incorporate um, and also share 
Uh, so look to um, future opportunities for um, adopting common methods and metrics across all FEMA programs, because right now, even all FEMA programs that support hazard mitigation don't, you know, don't necessarily share um, common goals and approaches to measurement and um, also to share information about how FEMA has publicly calculated um, benefits um, and uh, also how states and locals have done the same in order to uh, support their, uh, their loss avoidance analysis. And I'm going to now turn it over to Joe um, to walk through a more specific example of how we have uh, used the framework um, and are continuing to use the framework to uh, identify opportunities for climate adaptation across an entire infrastructure and what federal agencies can do to support that. Yeah, we're going to we're going to get through this really fast uh, so we can get to Q&A. Uh, if you want more details, uh, there's a link to the report that I'm about to cover down on the bottom of the slide. But basically what we're doing now as GAO is we are explicitly designing studies to look at federal programs and how we can build climate resilience into how those programs operate. From you know a soup to nuts, how the program works right now perspective. What is? How does it work? Who does what? Where does the money flow? How are the decisions made? Um, what is possible? So we look at literature and we look at, um, we talk to experts, we figure out how climate resilience could be built into what is right now. The agency might be trying to do some things, but it could do 20 more things, right? And we use the disaster resilience framework to talk about the benefits of heading in the right direction from what is towards a more climate resilient future that heads towards those different opportunities. So as you can see here, you know, we take a look at how the, we had a report on what the Federal Highway Administration was doing in relation to climate resilience and how that works. Next slide, please. So what we did is we mapped out um, on the left-hand side, the sort of flows of money in the different areas of the Federal Highway Administration and how those programs operate. We talk about them in the report and we laid out different options about how to improve the climate resilience of each of those parts of the Federal Highway Administration and all those different funding streams. We talk about the strengths and limitations of those different options in a qualitative sense so Congress and the agency can understand how they can do better. The point is like, how do we do this? Well, Federal Highway Administration, you have 10 different options where you can improve the climate resilience of your operations. So while it's not like a classic, you know, count to 10 and you're good type thing, we can point out like you have 10 ways to do better. And over time, we can evaluate whether the Federal Highway Administration is moving in the right direction, whether it decides to implement some of these options. And interestingly, some of these options were included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, which recently passed Congress. So we'll be monitoring that too. Next slide, please. So this is just an application of the disaster resilience framework to qualitatively talk about the benefits of comparing the status quo with one of the options. I'm not gonna belabor it, but that's how you can use the framework. If you want more details, you can look here or I'm happy to talk with you offline. Next slide, please. So again, what is possible? How can agencies enhance climate resilience? So what we did in this case with the Federal Highway Administration is we made a basically a recommendation to Congress, which is what we call a matter for congressional consideration that actually implement some of these options in law, the next transportation reauthorization, and they did so, and we're in the process of closing this matter for congressional consideration as implemented. And then we made rec recommendations for, for the Federal Highway Administration to, uh, within what it can control, actually improve its operations. And it has laid out some of those activities that it plans to pursue in its uh, adaptation plan for the Department of Transportation. Next slide, please. So uh, selected current events, we have all sorts of stuff underway now. We, have, we, we testified before Congress. We have 11 different studies underway right now where we're applying the disaster resilience framework in different ways. So basically we're busy advising Congress on how to improve federal programs and activities using the disaster resilience framework. And we're here to help if you have questions. Next slide, please. All right, and there's some resources if you choose to look at some of our recent work. Next slide. Now for Q and A, so I guess we're next presenter. Thank you very much for your time, we appreciate it. All right, well thank you, Joe. <clears throat> and thank you, Catherine, um, very informative. Um, okay, so now, in the interest of time, let's just get right to it. Last but certainly not least, um, to give our local perspective, 
is Dr. Marijevic. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Let me just make sure I'm doing the right thing here. We're seeing just a white screen right now, so maybe try to unshare and then reshare. Yeah, um, I haven't quite clicked through. Is, is that good? Yes, that's perfect. You, you see my full screen. Okay, yeah. great. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, I will be presenting a project that's an illustration of um, an implementation and evaluation of an adaptation initiative. So I won't be talking about approaches to adaptation so much as a particular application. Um, and how it fits into approaches we could possibly discuss later. There, I have a number of collaborators on this research who are listed here and just want to gratefully acknowledge funding from NOAA. Um, so the objective of the, of the entire study is to improve urban homeowners' capacity to adapt to flooding. And our site is New York City, and in particular, um, the Rockaways Peninsula, which I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's a narrow uh, barrier peninsula at the bottom of this map. The map shows the current 100-year flood plain. Uh, oh, for the slides are not progressing. I'm not sure if you've moved past the first slide. Oh, I have. Um, so I don't know what to do about that. Do you uh, want me to screen share? And you can tell me when to progress. Sure. Okay. We can me. swap yep. screen. And then let me. Um, so I guess I'll keep talking while you're getting that up. So the Rockaways Peninsula is a very flood prone area. It was uh, devastated during Hurricane Sandy, uh, and the flood risks are steeply increasing. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah, that one. Um, as sea levels rise. Um, the, in New York, since Hurricane Sandy, there has been quite a bit of effort to reach out to coastal communities to make them more aware of flood risks and to encourage uh, residents to take action to adapt to flooding to reduce future damages. From uh, research that we did prior to this study, we know that that action by and large isn't really happening. Um, relatively few residents uh, are taking any action, and that's not just in New York City, that's a broader issue everywhere. So the question arises, you know, how do we motivate residents to take adaptation action? Next slide, please. So this study is really, um, and if, if you could just keep, uh, yeah, next click. Okay, um, maybe stop clicking for a minute. Uh, okay, so um, uh, this study is organized around an evaluation question, actually. What we want to understand is does co-producing knowledge about flood risks and adaptation options influence adaptation behavior among coastal residents? Um, whose behavior, how, and why? And I'll get into the evaluation piece of this in more detail in just a minute, but first let me, just so you know what I'm talking about, let me discuss a little bit more about what the initiative is. So what we've done is we've engaged with um, uh, partners who are civic and homeowner associations. So we're working with residents of the Rockaways who are organized and by and large more informed than the average resident and we're doing that intentionally because uh, we know from prior experience that it's going to be hard to engage residents uh, it, around adaptation to flooding. And we want to work with those who are more likely to be interested. And if we're successful in engaging them and influencing behavior, we, get, we can observe over time whether um, improving information and changing behavior among the more organized, whether these uh, community organizations then disseminate the information and the change in behavior in communities more widely, uh, and that becomes kind of an approach to adaptation and how that happens and what we can do to support it, or whether there needs to be more uh, a wider sort of direct intervention. 
So with leaders of community associations, we co-developed a series of three workshops, which we then conducted with members of those community groups, focusing on flood risk and adaptation options. And we're very much focusing on, we ended up focusing on what individual homeowners can do. So we developed uh, one more click. So we developed information for um, what uh, for that can inform decisions by individual homeowners. And in the next three slides, I'll just show you really quickly what that looks like. So next slide, please. So we developed um, in these workshops uh, scenarios of particular families at particular addresses. So we would actually pick an address in the Rockaways and for that address, show people what level of water the family can expect in their house for various flood scenarios now and how that picture changes 30 years from now. So sort of over the time of a typical mortgage. Next slide. What, uh, how much that family can expect to pay in flood damages over the next 15 years and 30 years to recover from that flooding? And those numbers are based on our prior survey work documenting how much residents paid out to recover from Hurricane Sandy in homes that had various levels of flooding. Next slide, please. And then we go through a range of uh, actions that residents can take to reduce flood damages in their homes and we uh, analyze how much each action would save in future flood damages compared to what that action would cost the homeowner to take. And we offered to undertake this kind of analysis for any address, for any participant in the workshop. And a number of participants took us up on this offer and we sort of discussed um, discussed uh, those cases in the workshops. Next slide, please. So now to the evaluation. Uh, uh, yeah, the, if you could just stop there, thank you. Uh, the purpose of the evaluation is to see what difference does this all make? Does this influence behavior? We want to identify if this is an approach that effectively builds adaptation capacity. Does it improve planning, decision-making, adaptation outcomes? The reason this could improve outcomes, um, I may not have said earlier, is we're really focusing on actions that individual own homeowners can take with their own existing resources without waiting for public intervention for anything else to happen, really. And the second purpose is to just, if, if we find this to be effective in any way, to justify funding in, of, of a broader program. Next click. Um, so the evaluation, the, the main uh, kind of aspect of the evaluation question that we're interested in is how do the benefits and potential negative effects of this program differ across the population? The Rockaways is a very diverse peninsula. It has uh, populations that, uh, that can be found in many other places um, uh, because of that diversity. And so we want to understand how the benefits and potential negative effects of this program differ for different parts of that population and why, in order to understand how the lessons from the Rockaways can be applied in other locations. What can we learn from here that's more broadly applicable? Next click, please. And in the evaluation, you, uh, we're uh, interested in both the process, who is participating in this process and how, and the effect of this program on outcomes. Next slide. So we begin the evaluation uh, with uh, a program theory, uh, which uh, the first speaker referred to a theory of change. Program theory is essentially a theory of change and a theory of action. It demonstrates how the program is likely, intends to influence outcomes. How does the program work, essentially? So it typically lays out sort of inputs, actions that the program will take, outputs, outcomes, and impacts. And in that sense, it can serve as a guide and an organizing principle for the evaluation by identifying indicators of process and of outcomes that we need data on. 
But even if we identify those indicators, if we see a change in resilience indicators over time, setting aside the problem that's been discussed today of finding appropriate resilience indicators, at the local level you often can, um, but you may want to look at the problem more broadly. But even if you find a change of indicators uh, from before the program to after, um, in order to invest in the program or to have some faith in the program, you need to have some evidence that it's the program that's contributing to that change in indicators rather than it, the change happening for other reasons. Why should we think that the program is contributing? So an essential piece of a program theory is identification of mechanisms through which the program may actually influence outcomes. And the program theory then becomes a guide to, ident to looking for evidence for whether those mechanisms are actually working. And those mechanisms become kind of the signatures of the program. Like if they're, we, if we can show that they're active, we have some evidence that the program is contributing to a change in outcomes. So I, in the interest of time, I'm not laying out a full program theory in this slide. I just want to point out a few of the more important mechanisms for this particular program. So for example, we want to find evidence for whether information actually is a barrier to planning, decision-making, and action. It's, it's the information that makes a difference uh, rather than something else, rather, uh, or perhaps in addition to other barriers. Um, next click, please. Uh, that useful information, in order to produce useful information, we require the co-production component is required. And then the question becomes how much co-production, at what point, by whom? Next click. And that um, at least a component of useful information is information that is specific to decisions and actions that homeowners can make individually. Uh, next click. And finally, that the way that homeowners use that information and therefore its benefits will depend on a range of factors such as the resources that homeowners have, organizational capacity, networks, geography, other factors. Next click. So that the effect and one more so that the effect of the program on individual and collective outcomes is different for these different factors where the outcomes that we want to be looking at are our capacity, decisions that people make, actions that they take to actually protect their homes, and broader uh, resilience. Next slide, please. Uh, next click. So uh, our methodology, so, so um, sort of guided by that program theory, our evaluation methodology then is a mixed method one. Next click. We use qualitative methods to try and get at those mechanisms in the uh, program theory to identify if they're active and how, based on transcripts of workshops and meetings. Next click. And then we have a uh, quantitative component, which gets more at the attribution question, so at the question of um, how much is this program, if this program is changing outcomes, how much is it changing them in a causal sense? So uh, how much of the change is due to the program through an econometric approach called a difference in difference, where basically we're looking at the change, we're comparing the change in outcomes from baseline to follow up between groups who are participating in the program and groups who are not participating. But the quantitative and qualitative methods interact a lot more than this present than this way of presenting it um, might lead you to expect, because the quantitative piece can actually do quite a bit towards identifying uh, potential mechanisms through which the program is operating, and the qualitative piece serves both as a check on the quantitative piece and it um, adds a lot to the interpretation of the quantitative results. Next slide, please. So um, uh, a preliminary insights, and I call them preliminary insights because we haven't finished the evaluation yet. We're just now collecting the follow-up survey data. So the insights that we have at the moment are based on the qualitative piece. So analysis of what happened during our co-production process and the um, workshops. 
uh, so next click, two clicks actually. Um, and actually, uh, one more click and one more. Okay, if you could stop there. So um, first, at sort of at the baseline, um, where the participants in this program started based on the general, on the information about flood risk that they were receiving through all these outreach programs that have been happening in the city over the last 10 years since Hurricane Sandy, um, was a real sense of lack of agency. So people's perspective was, well, we know that we should raise our homes, but we really don't have the money to raise our homes, so we're not going to do anything, and it's really the job of the city government to, um, to uh, protect us from flooding. In fact, the city, in, uh, in partnership with a nonprofit, had created a website of information specifically for homeowners to assist homeowners with adaptation decisions. But people, based on what they knew, were really looking for information. And among this organized, well-informed group that we were working with, 80% were not aware of the existence of that website, even though uh, its existence was a big part of the outreach efforts. Next uh, click, please. Yeah, great. Um, considering individual risks during the process of the workshops really increased the sense of urgency and kind of personal responsibility. So there are kind of three components to this. One is, um, not surprisingly, the more you tailor information, we know that information has to be tailored in order to be useful. But I think what was interesting here that was coming out was the level to which it needed to be tailored. So information specific to the Rockaways, which had been provided before, was not enough. People really needed to see the information at the level of their homes in order to get their attention to even start thinking about the problem. Um, that, that kind of uh, personal information also gave them a, a sense of personal responsibility for the outcome. The other component is, um, next click please, the role of online information, because the, that website that the city had created had some homeowner specific information in it. But again, people weren't accessing it, people weren't really paying attention. And the other component of this is um, just the, the way in which the, the uh, information was communicated uh, in online versus this personal discussion that people got in the workshops. Next click, please. Um, the other thing that emerged is that simpler is not always better. What people found particularly empowering was to think in terms of a menu of strategies rather than one possibility. When they realized that they had options, they understood that first they could do something, and second, they better do something or otherwise the outcome may not be appropriate for their needs because different homeowners in different communities along the peninsula um, have uh, different things, different actions are appropriate for different homeowners in different communities. Next click, please. And um, considering those individual risks very quickly led to a discussion, an organic discussion within the group of a collective planning process. People, uh, participants realized that they need to coordinate on this planning process. Next click, please, rather than just making individual actions and began to raise questions of relocation, which they weren't willing to consider at the beginning. Next slide, please. So just in the interest of time, I am not going to talk much about what happens next for this project. We need to uh, do the follow up survey and finish the analysis. Um, we the community has decided that they want to keep this process going. That's a complicated you know, uh, it's a it's a challenging, complicated organizing, uh, um, disseminating the information, engaging elected officials. These are or, uh, kind of complicated actions that we're now uh, applying for funding to continue to support. Next couple of clicks, uh, yeah, and one more. Great, thank you. And our kind of longer term evaluation questions for this project is whether this. Um, 
information that uh, we've been developing and the motivation to act that we're beginning to see uh, growing among uh, the participants, whether it persists over time and disseminates in those communities, and if so, uh, how? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, really looking forward to the, the final results there. And um, now, again, in the interest of time, uh, let's just move straight on to the Q&A. So I'm wondering if it might be easiest if um, all the presenters wouldn't mind just turning their cameras on and we kind of treat this like a panel. That way we can all sort of see each other and it's not a um, on and off. And um, OK. Um, and I think then maybe what I'll do is um, combine a couple of these questions that are along a similar theme and maybe the first first one or first set um, mainly for Kinmani, but others should feel free to um, weigh in as well uh, if they have something to say. Um, the question, uh, the, the couple of questions are, um, what are the leading theories to know for m and &E for resilience work, just sort of in general, and then how to think about local theories of change that feed into global efforts? Sort of thinking about this in kind of a cross-scalar way. Any initial thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think what the question is asking, rather than what leading theories are for m &E, um, what a theory-based evaluation is, um, because an evaluation is really just, I mean, it's really bounded by a set of principles and you can decide what they are for your program, right? So in our case, for a lot of the evaluations we do, um, the principles that we um, that we focus on are identifying change in um, impact that are attributable to the program as a whole, um, and then advancing learning to inform both internal strategy and also resilience practice more broadly. Um, now, the eval there are a lot of different evaluation approaches that you could use. You know, there are, I mean, this is just a small set of kind of keywords that you can go search, like outcome harvesting, case studies, realist evaluations, horizontal evaluations, and the approach that you choose is really based on the program you're doing and the evaluation questions and priorities that you have. Um, so what a, the a theory based evaluation is, is an evaluation that is bounded by a theory of change. Um, Malgozio talked about it kind of from a more um, local level. Um, but a theory of change is effectively just a conceptualization of how your program is going to achieve change. And it's because programs like, you know, that are focused on climate resilience or climate adaptation, their higher level outcomes and the intended impacts and effects are quite lofty and take a really, really long time to achieve. So what you want to be able to do is, you know, realize or articulate a series of pathways that enable you to kind of get to that intended impact at some point. Um, and, you know, and within each of those outcome pathways, you know, you might define a series of inputs and activities um, and so on that kind of define how you reach those you know, how you plan to achieve those outcomes and proxy indicators for measuring whether you have progressed against those outcomes, um, those, you know, those intermediate outcomes or not. So that's kind of the, you know, that's broadly the setup of a theory of change. Um, and within that, in terms of trying to develop local theories of change that feed into global efforts, I mean, what, I mean, global efforts you know, are really just global objectives, right? I mean, you have Sendai, for example, the Sendai framework, um, which has, I think, seven odd objectives. And I think this is where what Malgozio was talking about, which is, you know, embarking on this like process of co-production is really, really important. What you are trying to do is develop a theory of change um, that is based in a deep understanding of the local context and local priorities and marrying that with 
global objectives and you know climate change protection projections and climate science so it's really about ensuring that what you are doing while it speaks to kind of global objectives is really grounded in the local context in a way that makes sense and meets the immediate and long-term needs and priorities that people have defined so I'm going to go ahead and say that's a very solid answer. Does anyone have yes. anything else to say about that? I do, have, I do have something very, very brief to add. It's basically sure. a, con a context specific way of helping people understand how to do better forever. Because you're never going to reach an end goal. You're never going to be there. You're always going to be adapting to climate change and improving over time. But you need to define the right direction in a way that people can understand based upon where they are, be it a federal program, be it a community that you're trying to help or so forth. And it really depends on, you know, defining the scope of what you're looking at and communicating with people where they are in a way that they can understand, but do better forever. All right. Um, let's see, then maybe we, let's move on to a quick one for, for everybody. Um, and this is, I guess, in some ways, a bit of a, a yes or no, but, um, has anyone or everyone on the panel heard of or used the educational materials from the Natural Hazard Mitigation Association? Or is that something that's not on folks' radar yet? All right, well, perhaps the um, the, the person who asked that question can put links um, in the chat and then maybe use this as a forum to uh, increase that. Okay, uh, let's see, how about a couple of Quick questions then for the uh, GAO folks about frustrations with some of the brass tacks of some of the implementation, and go ahead and um, reject these if they're a little, if the you know this is getting too specific. But um, one um, audience member was asking about the uh, extent to which standards and the information required for um, applications, um, especially for the NFIP National Flood Insurance Program, um, that kind of defeats or troubles small or low resource governments um, from making applications and is that so you know how relevant is that to balancing the one size fits all um, goal motivated by fairness and values Catherine shaking her nodding her head yeah I think this one's my arena um, to an extent um, I do so I will say that Equity in general is a concept that is definitely on the rise in the accountability community. And in fact, the set of standards that we use for government audits um, now names equity as one of the core principles that, that drives the uh, under our audits, which I think is a great um, development in recent times. I myself have recently worked on um, a, a report about equity and disaster assistance. Um, and I, it's a legitimate question, and it is, a, as the questioner is clearly um, recognizing, it's a legitimate tension between um, a, a lot of values. So I think in terms of when we think about the disaster resilience framework and how it comes in, I, there is a, both in terms of the incentives and disincentives piece and how complex things are for people to engage in the information piece what we want to see is the federal agencies thinking about how to build a bridge um, in in removing disincentives and providing information that can help everybody come to the table in an equitable manner and have the opportunities that they need to engage with the programs yeah, and just building on that a little bit, I mean, it, it's really tough to do climate resilience with grant programs because you're depending upon everybody having the same capacity and ability to navigate the federal, you know, there's a whole bunch of different grant programs, first of all, and they're all different. And it's just very hard for even knowledgeable people in this system to understand. So we hear you, we understand, we're trying to, as GAO, to make sense of that and make some recommendations to help clear some of that up. All right, and yeah, there are probably a few other um, questions along those lines, but sort of in the interest of um, uh, keeping things moving here, um, if, if, if anybody wants to contact uh, Joe or Catherine directly, I think they're able to do that um, if, I don't, if we don't get to them by the end. Um, but again, in the interest of time, let's, how about we throw a question uh, to Dr. Marijevich. Um, how about, I think this one seems to be something that's in 
a lot of local government want go, local governments want to know about. Um, do you have any recommendations on how to retrieve the cost savings value for taking action versus cost of recovery with no action? Yeah, that is <laughs> um, that is of great interest to a lot of people, and it highlights a real gap in um, data and information that we have, because we actually do not have really good information about costs of recovery. So uh, the main um, source of information are sort of damages to physical infrastructure. Uh, so there are quite a lot of studies on what damages to physical infrastructure are, but there are a lot of costs to recovery that are not damaged. Well, there are two issues there. One is how accurate are those damages to infrastructure that we're relying on? And there are some issues around that. The second one is that there are a lot of costs of recovery that are not captured by damages to infrastructure, especially when you're looking at residents, local businesses, um, it's huge beyond residents. There's a huge area of business loss and employment loss that probably dwarfs uh, damages to infrastructure. So we have some of the data that's needed to. Um, so for business, uh, for businesses, we probably have some data um, that we could use to get a better estimate at losses due to disaster. But that data is not free. It actually costs a lot of money to uh, use. Um, so it, that the reason we're not doing that, the reason everybody has this question is because it's not easy to get that information. And the reason I had it in this research project is because of survey data, because of a survey that I had done previously where I actually collected this information in a number of coastal neighborhoods in New York City directly from uh, residents. Um, I just wanted to add if I could. So you know this isn't so much about you know the cost of the cost savings value for taking action versus the cost of recovery but it's uh the cost about savings value for taking action versus the cost of loss and damages which is broader they tend to be you know there's a set that i believe the world bank and also iasa which is the institute for international systems analysis um based in austria have done for different disasters from a global perspective so for um floods for example it's um a cost savings um of five dollars um in losses and damages every dollar that you spend in ex ante action um you know there are different figures for wildfires and stuff at a national level there's i believe it's the national institute for building standards um that has um, that's done kind of a similar exercise, but it might be more infrastructure focused as Marco, as you mentioned. Uh, for all of these numbers, we have, we do have, no, there are numbers out there, but all of these numbers are missing a lot of the actual um, uh, costs of damages that, that uh, people who experience the recovery are bearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I think the real issue is, even if you had those data, uh, the problem is the mismatch between who pays and who experiences damages and when. The when part is key. So how how are you as a local community going to front money to um, avoid damages at some point in the future that the federal government and in current systems will probably cover? Seems like the incentive structure might be a little off there. And like many, and we're trying to get to the bottom of some of these programs and try to figure out a way to have it make more sense for decision makers now to invest the money up front. But it's really a mismatch of timing, less about not having the data. Um, there is also though the issue that a lot of the personal expenses end up showing up in public costs. So uh, a lot of those costs are an incentive for the public for the federal government, not just the federal government, every level of government, public funding to do a better job of funding preparation and mitigation of damages ex ante rather than recovery. As you say, funding the recovery um, sets up all kinds of bad incentives. Um, we could do a much better job of funding mitigation of those damages rather than recovery. You just did a great and, job and, of and explaining what it. Yeah, and to so justify like and to justify those investments, those losses that are otherwise incurred are really important to quantify. That's what part of where the importance of that data comes in. 
I, I, you know, as a, I don't disagree with that. And I also really like the point that the first speaker made about the power of narrative. Uh, you know, what is going to persuade people at the local level to make these investments? Is it going to be a bunch of abstract figures that might or might not come to pass? Or is it going to be stories of, of catastrophe and loss and, and avoidance of those things? I think it's, I think the end is key there because a lot of the local, um, the local decision makers are asking for the numbers as well. Yeah, I mean, what we've kind of, I mean, so we're part of the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance. And so we have, I think we have 23 different country programs right now. So we're, I mean, ICED is doing the um, monitoring and evaluation for all of those and coming up with cross program lessons. And what we're seeing is, you know, it's the power of, you know, people want evidence of what the gaps are at the local level. So having a really data driven approach is important and you need to pair it with adaptation options. So you need to pair it with the actual solution because if you just give people data on gaps, which they're interested in, you know, it's not enough. Like they still, I mean, there are so many capacity gaps um, at, at the kind of local government level that it needs to be supported with some sort of influence or advocacy on what their what their money and capacities should go towards. So that's what we've really seen very strongly in our programs. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of agreement uh, at all three scales that we featured today. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think just a hearty here here on that. <laughs> um, and hopefully those uh, proactive shifts are happen sooner than later. Um, but uh, to be continued, um, I think keeping one eye on time here, I think maybe I, we should sort of wrap things up just so that we don't get cut off here. Um, so um, with that, maybe I'll give another big thank you to all of our presenters today. Very, very informative. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just pass it along uh, back to Carrie and everyone can go save the world. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And a huge thank you again to our speakers. Um, I wanted to just put up everyone's name and contact information one last time here. Um, I know we didn't get the chance to get to all of our questions today, so feel free to follow up with our speakers if there's anything specific that you'd like to ask them. Um, in addition, the recording of this presentation will be going online, hopefully um, before the end of this week. So if there's anything that you want to rewatch, you will be able to do that at our website. And then I wanted to just one last time kind of advertise the rest of this series. Um, the third session will be taking place two weeks from now. You can register for that at nationaladaptationforum.org. Um, and just be on the lookout at the end of this series, you will be receiving an email that has a survey kind of just asking how the series went. Are there things that you liked? Are there areas where we could improve? So keep an eye out for that. Um, and one last time, I will thank our speakers and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Bye everybody.